the fourth is impossible. Leaving a boy as peculiar as Schofield, alone and unsupported except for a butler, was beyond cruel. Whether his father, the late Humphrey Jeffers, Seventh Lord Radland, had thought that before the accident was doubtful, but then everything about the family was peculiar. Take, for instance, the accident. Humphrey, a portly chap with an outrageous moustache, loved nothing more than to trot off to Africa on a hunting safari. However, confined to home by the national virus lockdown, he decided to focus on taking his 12 bore to the squirrels of the estate. Kaboom! This proved to be his undoing. In the long dining room, the main feature was a ceiling decorated with foliage and hidden colourful birds and, unfortunately, a painted squirrel. And spotting this, late one evening he succeeded not only in potting the squirrel, but bringing down half a tonne of chandelier, killing him instantly, still clutching a bottle of Queen's Birthday 20-year-old mould. The young Schofield's principal inheritance was the hall, a vast and seriously dilapidated mansion, now with a hole in the ceiling and the services of a butler, Leighton. His only relative was Aunt Clementine, who lived across the valley with her daughter, Gideona, somewhat predictably known as Giddy. Schofield was one of life's oddball characters. Fish eyes that peered out uncertainly from his face, shaped like an exclamation mark along thin neck, supported by sloping shoulders and puffed lips that groped for air didn't help. But, to be fair, it wasn't the boy's fault. He was a dead ringer for his father. And what will you do with yourself, Schofield? These are very dark days for you to be left alone. You can't stay here. Aunt Clementine was adamant in a way that only she could be. The Jeffers gene stretched not only to oddities, but included an imperiousness that Aunt Clementine accentuated by peering over the top of her reading glasses as she drank her tea. Guff, replied Schofield, his mouth filled with doughnut. Guff, what on earth do you mean, boy? Speak up, commanded his aunt. I believe his lordship is referring to his plan for a golf course, madam. Leighton, the butler, replied. His lordship received only recently an unsolicited copy of Golf Monthly, and he was very struck by the impossibility of the game. His intention is to build a course here in the hall and become proficient at it. Of course, at the moment, it will have to be an indoor golf course. Aunt Clementine shook her head despairingly at this further evidence of instability. Oh, no, Leighton, no, Leighton. The walls must be knocked down to extend the course to 30 metres. We need sand for at least three bunkers. The elegant long dining room, created by James Athenian Stewart, was slowly being ravaged. Antique Persian carpets were sliced open in many areas and filled with cement to create an undulating effect. Wonderful Italian marble hearths became moats filled with water and a Georgian giltwood mirror reflected the light. The ceiling was painted with sky blue with a smattering of cumulus clouds. The results were spectacular. Schofield appraised his handiwork, feeling mighty pleased with himself. Oh, if only his father could see it. He grabbed his club to tee off, informing Leighton he need not caddy, and overshot into the rough. The rough was a Persian carpet trussed up in small folds along the outer course of the fairway. Nine shots later, he holed it. He didn't fare any better on the second. Catching the bunker in the third was disastrous, the ball landing in a water-filled Palladian fireplace twice. And then, the impossible fourth. It was a stinker of a hole. To begin with, it wasn't technically on the course, but above it. 
The ball was aimed right in the middle of an antique cabinet against the wall. Schofield had drilled a hole ever so slightly bigger than a golf ball. The trick was to chip uh, <laughs> and hope for the best. He failed miserably. No matter how hard he tried, he could not, for the life of him, drive it home. He realised what he had done was create a hole that was damn near impossible. How he regretted not knocking down the two bay windows and extending the fourth down the croquet lawn. But no matter. He was a Jeffers and made of stern stuff. He would, if it took him years, pop the damn thing in the end. The back five weren't too bad, apart from catching the tricky double bunker on both sides of the seventh. For weeks of the government lockdown, Schofield did nothing but play the course. But the impossible fourth eluded him. Leighton encouraged, consoled, cajoled, suggested surrender, all ineffectually. And then one day the doorbell rang. <clears throat> My lord, the Honourable Gideona, your cousin, announced Leighton. Oh, Giddy, my saviour. Oh, surely, surely you'll be able to help. The look on Schofield's peculiar face was anguished. I can't, con I can't conquer the impossible force. As he watched Gideona bent over the ball, grasping the club near the base, her knees locked together, her legs spread out at 45 degrees, her long hair hanging down like a weeping willow. To Schofield, there was something rather fetching about her stance. In fact, so taken was he that he didn't notice her strike the ball and see it whiz through the cabinet hole. However, when he realised what she'd done, and she standing there wondering where the, where the ball went, he embraced her, crying out, Oh, good Lord! Oh, you've potted the dreaded fourth! You've potted the dreaded Forth. And as they both clung to one another, himself rubbing against her in delight, something wonderfully odd stirred in the lower regions of his anatomy. Schofield Jeffers, 8th Lord Rutland, was about to reach puberty. <laughs>